One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster. Places, names, and where it was you meant to travel, none of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like write it like disaster. So the line in the poem that resonates most, I would say, is the last line or the second to last line because uh, I think that is where the poem really changes and, and develops and um, opens up to another level of, of uh, intimacy and honesty. So because of, uh, you know, w when not too hard, when the line changes from the art of losing is not hard you know, isn't hard to master, to not too hard to master. Suddenly the poem is inflected with a lot more self-doubt. Suddenly that facade cracks a little bit in that line with not too hard to master. Uh, and that opens up the poem quite a bit. And then with the final line there, especially the parenthetical write it, you know, when the narrator is speaking to herself uh, and trying to goad herself into the actual writing and accepting um, what had been a really confident poem opens up and becomes much less confident and more human I think in those last two lines so those are uh, those are two that really I think mean a lot to me and to the poem it's a poem about experience you know and so the way that the poem is structured the experience of loss starts with very quotidian things, you know, with the, the lost door keys, the hour badly spent, uh, and then slowly builds up to more, uh, to deeper losses and more difficult losses, uh, and, and uh, losses that are harder to master, and losses that are harder to recover from without uh, disaster. I've lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster some realms I own, two rivers, a continent. I missed them when it wasn't a disaster, even losing you. Uh, you know, those are deeper losses and I think the poem kind of ages in a way and grows in experience as from beginning to end so I would say that yeah as I mean and I've probably been I first read this poem probably 20 years ago maybe about that and so I would say reading it a couple times a year at least you know probably over those 20 times or 20 years uh, I've become uh, or I've been able to appreciate really the depth of it, you know. It's a villanelle, right? So it's a really one of the most difficult forms, English language poetry forms. Um, and anyone can admire that. You see the rhymes and the, and, and the intricacy of that. And I think on first read you can admire and appreciate and recognize the kind of formal mastery. But the real content of the poem, I think, to really understand it in a way that uh, is meaningful you have to live through you know some of those losses and I think that that has you know came with me with me it came through time you know and it's interesting that she chose Elizabeth Bishop chose this really difficult form that takes a lot of verbal and poetic mastery to achieve um, to talk about the idea of mastering loss and so the poem, you know, it's about loss, but it's also about art, and it's about, you know, mastery. And she is, interestingly, you know, she's demonstrating her poetic mastery while she's talking about her inability to master something else, which is loss. And one art, you know, the art of losing, so she's elevating loss to, to an art. 
I think all of her poems are a kind of antidote to a lot of our con contacts with language today and, you know, in poetry, social media, just the way that, you know, the frivolous use of language today, uh, the idea of someone taking 20 years on a poem is, you know, about as far from reality as we can imagine. Everything's so ironic today and, and, and you know, it's being uh, genuine and being, uh, you know, honest and trying to say something deep from your own experience that might be able to resonate with the universal human experience, all of that's, you know, very passe, I think now. And so in a way, the poem is very much, you know, against, it's out of step with the way we think about writing, feeling like you needed to master your materials in order to be an artist and feeling the need that you need to impart some kind of message that's universal and timeless and important and real. I haven't lost my door keys in a long time. Um, hour badly spent. I try to use my time really wisely. So one time when I was a kid, I had these dog tags, these like military identification things that you could send away for G.I. Joe, this American uh, like soldier toy. And get your name like, you know what I mean? Stamped on them and came in the mail. So they were super cool. And I was standing, uh, my friend and I were standing across the street and throwing them one day, throwing them over the telephone wires and catching them going back and forth. And at one point, I don't know, I threw them or he threw them and it got wrapped around the wires. And I was really, you know, devastated. Uh, and this woman, there was like this African woman, um, who lived in this apartment on the corner and she came out or she had seen seen it somehow or whatever and said like you know ask the lord and the lord will you know the lord will provide or something like that and so uh did i i can't i probably i can't remember i probably did pray to get my things back uh and like the next day the doorbell rang and uh nobody was there but the things were like on the uh on the stairs true story so like i happen to be wearing a hat now I don't always wear hats, but I was wearing, years ago, it was during the Fringe Festival, so it was around this time of year, and uh, I had, was doing a show, and I was wearing, I had got this hat in Berlin, uh, and it was, you know, this, it's probably from like the 40s or something, this old, like, nice hat in a secondhand shop or whatever, and during the show, like, I would wear, it was kind of part of the thing that I would wear for the show, not like, you know, what it, I would I would always wear this hat and so the sh we did probably five or six shows like over the course of the week or something maybe maybe it was seven nights and uh, this hat kind of was like it was giving me secret powers uh, in all like in all of my pursuits that week I, it was giving me special powers it was like the second to last night of the festival <coughs> and uh, Long story short, I ended up, uh, I was with this person and we were hanging out and we ended up going to sleep in Kampa Park underneath uh, a pear tree. I don't think we planned to sleep there all night, but you know, it was really late and we decided we couldn't make it back to my place in Smikov, so we just needed to take a little rest there. So uh, long story short, wake up a couple hours later, uh, my, my hat was gone and uh, but somebody had like stolen her passport. <laughs> so I couldn't really complain, you know what I mean? But I was really, <laughs> I was really upset about losing this hat. Uh, mostly, you know, because it had been, it had become like my Samson lock, you know, the, the, the locks of Samson, I realized. And I've never found, you know, I've gone back to Berlin, I've never found a hat like that. It was like the, the magic hat. So I don't know whoever took it, it must have changed their life, you know? You know, obviously, when you have something and then you no longer have it through circumstances that you cannot control, you know, that's that's loss. Something that you have and you want to have, and you, if you could choose, you would keep having that thing. And then, yeah, through circumstances that aren't your own, it's, uh, it's taken from you, right? So, like, loss and theft aren't the same, but they're very closely related. And, and sometimes the things we lose aren't ever physically with us, they're just somewhere, you know, in, in our mind and we feel this connection to them and, yeah, kind of a reliance. You know that you can rely whenever, if it's like, you know, when you look into your pocket, 
the key keys are going to be there or you know you can call your mother up you know when you need to or um, this kind of even if you don't physically come into contact with the thing every day you feel some kind of connection so it has some kind of presence you know in your life time goes on and I think it becomes you know the loss is no longer felt so much as a loss because uh, you know your life kind of crowds in around to fill up that hole of you know the hole that was left vacant when the thing was lost um, that can take a really long time sometimes we do it you know ourselves as quickly as we can we just go to the used phone store and buy the new phone because we don't even want to go through the feeling of loss I do that like if I've lost my phone and I just like immediate like the same day I'll just go out and get a new you know just because it's like I don't even want to go there you know and and it can be remedied that kind of loss can be remedied so instantly so I always kind of just do that uh, but you know the losses that can't be remedied the ones that we really don't have any control over or the things that we lose that are absolutely irreplaceable uh, yeah it's just a painful process of living without the thing until it doesn't uh, you know until the vacancy doesn't feel so heavy and that can take you know a long time a short time it really depends on the thing that's lost and other things that are happening um, you know I think and it can't be it can't be uh, faked if you keep your, you know you keep yourself busy we hear this you know oh yeah I broke up with him or my mom died or whatever and so I'm like keeping myself really busy um, or you always tell people make sure you stay busy and don't you know don't linger over it or don't this and that um, I think it's you know you can stay busy and and keep up the blare of, uh, of events and things, but uh, when you're laying in bed at night and it's just you and the universe, if that loss is still there, it's the, you know, it's still there. So, you know, but Rilke would say like, uh, that you've got to walk into the loss. If the loss is a vacancy, you know, you have to allow yourself to be swallowed by the loss and to kind of enter that vacancy and not deny it and not um, turn away from it um, and so you know I think metaphysically that's probably good advice